every single thing that exists, and I'm not kidding, everything that exists springs out of this womb, this football-like shape. It sounds like a wild, improbable, crazy thing to say, but it's absolutely true. I developed a way of looking at this through the intricate order that's based really on quantum theory. And the way it works is to consider that there's a wave. You may think of this wave coming from outside from the whole universe, which uh, converges to a point and then diverges again. Now, it, it links everything. It means that everything is internally related to everything. Now. Uh, Of course, the real world is a bit more complicated than this little circular dish. Uh, we don't know whether it has a circular boundary or not. Uh, that doesn't really matter. Uh, but the thing is, it is three-dimensional, not two-dimensional. So the wave structures are likely to be rather more complicated than this. However, we can understand that in a universe full of vibration, that centers can exist which have particle-like properties, which will have different phases that can account for the different charges of different particles, but that these are standing waves and that the energy coming into each one and the energy going out of each one is the same energy that passes through the centre as the concentric waves converge on the spot and then go out. And that the arrangement of all of these different ones is supporting the phases of the waves of all other particles. Every particle in the universe is being constantly recreated by the energy of all other particles. This is something which is not really understood by physicists, and I think it's a very important point if we want to understand how the universe works. We do need to say that nature actually works like this. Animations is Gabriel Lafreniere, and he showed here how a wave is made from the incoming part, a standing wave, plus the outgoing part, these two components together make a standing wave, um, which, which you can see here. Uh, so it appears to just stand in space, but it's actually composed of the inwards and outwards waves. Of course, the outwards wave is just the inwards wave after it has passed through the center and comes out again of the spherical wave descending on a point. So this, this type of wave has the correct properties that we need to explain particles. If the particle is in motion, then the point at which it's converging has to be moving. So the, the waves are converging on a point and coming out from a point in opposite ways. So when you get the standing wave, you get this suddenly a strange effect where the wave that we saw before has superimposed on it these other bands of alternating phase. And these are the Broglie waves. All these calculations, as we had all managed to derive these calculations that show the de Broglie waves from this understanding of standing waves, but in this animation, uh, Gabriel has made it very clear uh, how these, what's actually going on, and the understanding of all of these things. It's clear that these are real waves. Real waves are happening that explain the, the nature of matter as being standing waves. Every single thing that exists, and I'm not kidding, everything that exists springs out of this womb, this football-like shape. It sounds like a wild, improbable, crazy thing to say, but it's absolutely true.
Another way of saying it. The wave is a projection from the spiritual universe of rest to a resting point in the physical universe and back again to the spiritual universe for renewal of power to repeat the journey. pretty much agrees. The universe is created by division. That ultimate mystery, that great creative force, which is the all, God-mind, unity consciousness, that oneness divides and becomes duality and voila, the Big Bang. God-mind as single-pointedness divides and becomes duality and all relationship begins right there. And out of this relationship, of course, two circles of common radius and the Vesica Pisces. Vesica Pisces. So let's look a little closer at this Vesica Pisces, huh? Right there it is, that's it. When we get to four circles of common radius, which naturally evolve out of these points C and D, the Vesica Pisces is in the middle. But we have now five Vesica Pisces inside four circles of common radius. One, two, three, four, five. Ah, interesting. With the creation of those points C and D, we have, within the Vesica Pisces, a triangular situation. So we started with unity, we evolved into duality, and now we have an evolution to Trinity. This is the birthplace of trigonometry, an entire division of mathematics born in the Vesica Pisces. Huh? Those two points, C and D, bisect the Vesica Pisces and create the cross in the center and a new center, point X. So this introduces the transcendental nature of this pattern. It slips all the way into infinity and all the way out to infinity with smaller and smaller and smaller overlapping circles and larger and larger and larger overlapping circles all the way to infinity. So, you can't learn about the Vesica Pisces in a few minutes. This is an unbelievably deep and rich form, literally the womb of the universe. Everything that is springs out of the Vesica Pisces everything, all unfolding and spiraling and spiraling and spiraling into what we see as this manifest universe. We are sacred geometry. We spring right out of the Vesica Pisces. Omnipresent principles of the universe. That is what sacred geometry is. And the Vesica Pisces, or the Vesica Pisces, is right in the heart of that. what I'm talking about.
The wave is a projection from the spiritual universe of rest to a resting point in the physical universe and back again to the spiritual universe for renewal of power to repeat the journey. Point A around point B, that makes a circle. Point A around point B, that makes a circle. But these two single points are clones. And those two points have equal potential. So not only can point A rotate around point B, but point B can also rotate around point A. This is one radius that both circles share. That black form in the middle there, that's called the vesica piscis or the vesica piscis, depending on what you prefer. The vesica piscis is literally the womb of the universe. This is the whole essence of the universe. I'm not kidding. Sounds like a real crazy thing to say, but two circles of common radius and this shape in the middle that it makes called the vesica piscis is the whole root of sacred geometry. Literally every single thing that exists, and I'm not kidding, everything that exists springs out of this womb, this football-like shape. It sounds like a wild, improbable, crazy thing to say, but it's absolutely true. Everyone pretty much agrees. The universe is created by division. That ultimate mystery, that great creative force, which is the all, God-mind, unity consciousness, that oneness 
divides and becomes duality and voila, the Big Bang. God-mind as single-pointedness divides and becomes duality and all relationship begins right there. And out of this relationship, of course, two circles of common radius and the Vesica Pisces. Vesica Pisces. So let's look a little closer at this Vesica Pisces, huh? Right there it is, that's it. When we get to four circles of common radius, which naturally evolve out of these points C and D, the Vesica Pisces is in the middle. But we have now five Vesica Pisces inside four circles of common radius. One, two, three, four, five. Ah, interesting. With the creation of those points C and D, we have, within the Vesica Pisces, a triangular situation. So we started with unity, we evolved into duality, and now we have an evolution to trinity. This is the birthplace of trigonometry, an entire division of mathematics born in the Vesica Pisces. Huh? Those two points, C and D, bisect the Vesica Pisces and create the cross in the center and a new center, point X. So this introduces the transcendental nature of this pattern. It slips all the way into infinity and all the way out to infinity with smaller and smaller and smaller overlapping circles and larger and larger and larger overlapping circles, all the way to infinity. So, you can't learn about the Vesica Pisces in a few minutes. This is an unbelievably deep and rich form, literally the womb of the universe. Everything that is springs out of the Vesica Pisces. Everything. All unfolding and spiraling and spiraling and spiraling into what we see as this manifest universe. We are sacred geometry. We spring right out of the Vesica Pisces. Omnipresent principles of the universe. That is what sacred geometry is. And the Vesica Pisces, or the Vesica Pisces, is right in the heart of that. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. ...of these statements are huge because with the new science proving that the brain is not the origin of consciousness, the whole edifice of materialism collapses. It also leads on to the question what happens when we die if the death of the body isn't the end of consciousness? And I just did my talk this afternoon to the people in the, our, our group. I was giving them a different view of what happens after death. <laughs> I shall soon find out. <laughs> so Nassim Haraman suggests that as we extend our awareness to the entire planet, the feedback loop with the underlying field is extended and amplified. If we could extend it to reach the galactic level, we would get more feedback from that level. In other words, nature, matter, energy, the quantum field, all communicate with us, and it's high time we began to communicate with them. 
The more conscious of this we are, the more they will communicate. There is constant interaction between the quantum ground and its manifestations. Now I would like to return to the Planck units because the foundation of unified physics is the Planck spherical unit. And Nassim has given this, this diagram of what it might look like if colossally enlarged. So it has a spherical form. It is an electromagnetic oscillator. It is the smallest unit of matter. He said to compare it to the smallest kind of pixel on your computer. Untold numbers of these electromagnetic oscillators constitute the ground of the material universe. And compared to the size of a proton, the size of a Planck unit is like a grain of sand compared to the size of the whole universe. Can't take it in. The proton is covered with countless trillions of these tiny Planck units, both on its surface and inside it. Nassim gives us this diagram of the proton with the Planck spherical units both inside it and covering the outside. Whereas the proton is about 20 orders of magnitude larger in size than the Planck unit, the Planck unit is some 19 orders of magnitude, about 10 billion billion, more massive than the proton. It's hugely heavy, which just seems incredible. So the whole universe is vibrating in a gigantic electromagnetic field. Everything that we see around us, all of nature, the earth and the sun, even black holes at the center of galaxies are made up of minute Planck spherical oscillators, collectively organizing in coherent structures in certain regions of space. This lattice of oscillating, oscillating planks completely fills all apparently empty space. And all of the protons inside us are made of these minute Planck oscillators that constitute the field of information that is our body but this field of information is connected to all the other fields around us through the protons. Mass is actually the energy generated by the minute electromagnetic Planck oscillators in the structure of space-time, creating an energy event that we identify in space as energy or mass and that becomes the foundation of our reality. Although space-time appears continuous and smooth at the macro level of our perception, it is granular at the micro level of the Planck scale. The structure of the proton at the Planck level, at the Planck scale, contains the information of every other proton holographically encoded inside its volume. The proton surface is entangled with all the others in the universe through Planck-sized wormholes in the structure of the vacuum. These wormholes are fluctuating vortices that are spinning at the speed of light. As well as the oscillation, these vortices are also spinning. And they're spinning and connecting with each other through the wormholes that are themselves rotating. So the whole thing is just a mass of rotating movements. And the spin of the proton is what creates a gravitational field, according to Nassim. I can't go into gravity because I'm not um, experienced enough to talk about it. So each proton is connected to all others through the wormholes that act like network cables with instantaneous transmission, resulting in all the protons in the universe being connected and synchronized in a superconductive cloud network that updates instantly with every change. It's a bit like our computer and, and storing our information on cloud, I thought as an analogy. The proton has been continuously spinning for over 13 billion years. And the spin of the Planck spherical units has fueled the spin of the proton throughout this time. And the surface of all the protons added together equals the surface of our universe. Now, this was a tremendous discovery of, of uh, Nassim. He found that the vacuum divides. He shows this in a video, which is, I can't show you, I have to take it from this diagram, but he found that the vacuum divides into very specific units at set mathematical intervals. And the divisions between these data points are very close 
to the phi ratio of 1.618. This absolutely astounded him that it was so mathematically exact. The Planck oscillators, the smallest known units of matter, trillions of times smaller than the proton, act at all of these scales to create mass. So we can visualize our world and ourselves as embedded in this web or lattice of Planck fluctuations, which are communicating across vast universal distances from every one of our protons to the visible surface of the universe. The universe is also spherical or three-dimensional in form. Knowing ourselves as part of this web of life unites everything that is part of our existence and helps us to know that our existence is part of the harmonic and integrated relationship of the whole universe. I think this is what Pythagoras must have learnt from the Egyptian priest astronomers and that formed the basis of his understanding of the harmony of the universe. But we lost the whole connecting theory uh, that is in this um, Nassim's theory. The Planck units on the surface of the proton and within it are spherical or toroidal in shape. They can't be touching each other as if they were placed next to each other on the spherical surface of the proton, this would leave gaps. They intersect with each other in order for them to be packed closely together with no space between. And the solution is shown in the next picture. Here's the proton. This is a larger diagram of the proton as shown in the Resonance Academy course. Nassim tried at first to see whether a square lattice would fit over the spherical proton, but it left gaps at the top and bottom. Then he tried the hexagonal form. Note the hexagonal flower-like forms covering the surface of the proton as well as inside it. And this was one of the most important discoveries that he made. But then he needed to find out what the geometrical forms were, were that were creating the hexagon and this brought him to the tetrahedron. The resulting triangulating pattern of the overlapping structure of the Planck spherical units generates the pattern of the flower of life, which is a hexagonal pattern containing the tetrahedron geometry within it. Another way of saying it is that the wave is an emergence from the static condition of rest through the dynamic condition of motion to the static condition and back again, or that it is an extension of cause through effect and back again through effect to cause. Between every pulsation of movement, there is a period of stillness, which divides every compression expansion sequence. You can knowingly say that the power expressed in motion is not really in the motion, but is in the stillness, which divides motion. If that is true, life itself, which is presumed to be motion, must have its source in eternal rest. If death is presumed to be non-motion and life is dependent upon it to express life, the only possible conclusion is that life is two ways, both of which have their source in rest. But that the uh, standing waves and that the energy coming into each one and the energy going out of each one is the same energy that passes through the center as the concentric waves converge on the spot and then go out. And the time will come in the unfoldment of man when his inner sensory perception will equal his outer sensory perception. When that time comes, he will know that motion only seems but has no existence. Present day man's senses do not permit him to perceive 
the simultaneously voiding motion, which cancels out the one they do see. So a blending of lots of little energy jumps gives rise to what appears on a large scale a very smooth continuous energy exchange. But when you start looking closely enough at one electron in a molecule losing energy to another electron somewhere else, we found little bit bits. Someone this is charged. what Max Planck did in 1900, didn't he? Planck discovered this. What they call a standing wave. Kids wave a jump rope up and down. It has always a, a fixed pattern. And the, the wave patterns of atoms and molecules have fixed patterns. When the energy changes, it changes moving from one pattern to another pattern. And only certain are allowed, and that explains why. And only certain, only certain energy states are allowed. Okay. People ask me, uh, why did you become a physicist? The fact of the matter is, I why never become a physicist. I uh, wanted to be a fix-up man. The spiritual aspects and, and why science uses matter to try to define matter, which again, a particle, you can't even, what a particle of what? What is it a part of? How can a particle <laughs> be used to describe another particle? Right. Again, it's like saying uh, the left side of the seesaw is responsible for the right side's motion, but yet any numbskull can look at the center of the seesaw and see that fulcrum there that doesn't move. You know, and that's one thing science can't see, so yet they deny it exists. It's Welcome to the chemistry question, Jordan here. I talked in a recent video about models of the atom and how our views of the atom have changed over time. It talks about how the electron cloud model is the current model of the atom. Last week, the first photo of a hydrogen atom was taken using a quantum microscope. The image confirms hydrogen's wave function. That is, we see the electron modeling a probability cloud around the atom, with regions of high intensity where expects it, as well as nodes where the electron does not appear. That is, we see the electron modeling a probability cloud around the atom, with regions of high intensity where expects it, as well as nodes where the electron does not appear. Hydrogen was chosen because it has the simplest electron configuration, this one electron in the lowest energy state. The research team is going to attempt to get an image of helium next. Heavier elements will be much more difficult, however. Thank you for watching the chemistry question. Be sure to subscribe and leave any questions or suggestions in the comments below. Until next time. Fulcrum there that doesn't move. You know, and that's one thing science can't see, so yet they deny it exists it's it's not just i can't see it or i don't know it's there it's that no that doesn't exist it must be something in the seesaw the plank of wood itself let's look at this particle of the wood and try to use that to describe the motion of the wood well that that kind of approach is failing i mean there's no it, it leaves you with all these disproportionate theories that they're trying to marry together these you have you know a hundred different explanations from string theory to the, the you know the 500th plank all the way down to quantum this and quantum that and and somewhere they're trying to marry all these disproportionate theories together to create one big grand unified theory well less is more you know the yeah. simplest explanation is always the truest and i have not encountered a model yet that's simpler than the cubic wave field model and more explanatory in the effects of motion because I myself know that even at the center of myself when I calm myself from an emotional you know back and forth I can think more clearly I mean you, you don't have clear thoughts in horizontal thinking you're stuck on the seesaw but when you become vertical when you think vertically like the great geniuses do you complete the cross and you can access the totality of your being to bring it into existence uh, new ways, new approaches, solutions, if you will. They don't call it a soul solution for nothing. I mean, you're bringing it down where it never existed into being. And so you're learning to manifest creative principles within your own life that, you know, how can you fix somebody else if you can't even fix yourself? That's, you know, again, the great self-work is what 
all this philosophy is is here to do. The science is the act of acting out your concepts into physical form. There's a very real process to that, and I think it's uh, what makes their work some of the greatest work out there. It's it's inspirational. I would advise everybody to to you know take your own time and and start with one of the books. Start with the booklet. I guarantee you'll find inspiration in it, and it's uh, that's the the real attractor. That's what brought me more and more into the work is that it was just one constant inspiration after another. And I, I don't, you know, claim to have been all that greatly well read, but everything I have read, I've never encountered any kind of material before or since that that leaves one so inspired, which just creates the the will and the desire to absorb more. And it's a, it's been a magical journey. Well said. Brilliant. Yeah, that's there's no doubt when I when I've read of Walter Russell it truly inspires me. I mean, it's it's brilliant. It's people think our particles are spherical wave structures consisting of an outgoing wave combined with a an in wave. Mathematicians are fairly happy with this because these are the only two possible solutions of the equations. So that part is okay. Now the center of this structure behaves just like a particle. The only problem is not many people know it yet because not many people have investigated it. But that the uh, standing waves and that the energy coming into each one and the energy going out of each one is the same energy that passes through the centre as the concentric waves converge on the spot and then go out. And the time will come in the unfoldment of man when his inner sensory perception will equal his outer sensory perception. When that time comes, he will know that motion only seems but has no existence. Present day man senses do not permit him to perceive the simultaneously voiding motion which cancels out the one they do see. The eternal you is that center and your eternal body is that series of four rings of fluorescent light which is eternally wrapped around that centering soul of the eternal you. Those four rings are eternal records of you. They are as immortal as you are immortal. They are the microfilm of you, yourself. Hello and welcome to Coast to Coast AM's official YouTube channel. I'm your host, George Norrie. Like, share, and subscribe to our channel. And you can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And of course, on coasttocoastam.com. Up next, Dr. Evan Alexander joins us. An incredible story, proof of heaven. That's next on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Norrie. For the next couple hours, you're going to hear an incredible story, a story we talked about several weeks ago. Dr. Eben Alexander, a renowned academic neurosurgeon, spent 54 years owning these scientific skills, world's view. He thought he knew how the brain and mind worked, but a near-death experience in which he was driven to the brink of death and spent a week deep in a coma with a brain infection changed all of that. 
He's written his book and his story, Proof of Heaven, A Neurosurgeon's Journey into the Afterlife, and he's with us right now, Dr. Evan Alexander. Evan, how are you? I'm doing well, George. How about you? Good. It's good to have you on. Did you ever expect this kind of notoriety after coming out with this story? Well, I expected it would uh, definitely have an impact, but it's far uh, kind of outgrown very quickly what I thought would happen, at least at the introduction. Our investigative reporter who's going to do a segment on you at the uh, end of November, Linda Moulton House, said that she had a chance to interview you today. Oh, yeah, we had and a great talk. All excited. She's a great reporter. And uh, th- this is just, it's an incredible story. I want you to tell us what happened to you, the meningitis. And, 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 and after that, let's talk a little bit about your belief system prior to this thing happening to you. But how did you get sick? What happened? Well, it uh, it really it struck me like a like a freight train. I mean, out of the blue, uh, this was uh, 4:30 in the morning on uh, on November the 10th of 2008, uh, just about four years ago, and um, I'd been uh, very healthy and uh, woke up that morning with severe back pain and uh, thought that maybe if I could get in a warm bath that would help, and it only got worse, and then I could barely get back to the bed and my wife was rubbing my back, trying to make me feel better, and uh, that was not working. Then my uh, son, Bond, who at that time was 10 years old, uh, came in the room, realized I hadn't left for work yet, and he started rubbing my temples, and I realized I had a, a very severe headache. I mean, like he drove a white-hot railroad spike right through my head. Oh, and uh, my last words to my wife were, don't call 911, you know, trust me, I'm a doctor, this is muscle spasm, and, and then I was gone for a week. Well, and, and now let's go back. Prior to this episode occurring, and we're going to get into the things that happened to you when you were in uh-huh. this, this situation, in this coma, what was your belief system about life after death? The eternal you is that center, and your eternal body is that series of four rings of fluorescent light, which is eternally wrapped around that centering soul of the eternal you. Those four rings are eternal records of you. They are as immortal as you are immortal. They are the microfilm of you, yourself. Every expression of motion is in the octave wave, and I knew the wave. And in the wave is the secret of creation, and I had that. I knew it in a timeless flash. And God said to me, There will be those who will question. There will be those who doubt. There will be those who crucify you. I give you to thee a sign by which thou canst prove thyself. Thou who has never known a chemist's laboratory shall know chemistry beyond men. To thee all chemists will come for knowledge of the light. Thou who has never known the stars, save with thine adoring eyes, shall know the stars beyond all men. All astronomers will come to thee for the new mappings of the universe of the stars, which thou shalt give to them. To thee who study mathematics was a dreary thing shall I give the master key to mathematics. To thee all mathematicians will come for knowledge of the key to motion and the curvature of space. And one thing after another like that, I'm trying to recall the exact words from the divine Iliad. 
That was to be a sign whereby I could prove my right to speak with authority. And the signs never failed. And with them came the admonition that I should keep perfectly quiet and not herald my messengership for seven years, but should prepare for the first rehearsal of it by thine written word. The electrochemical records of the zero seed of all things are the zero elements which are known as the inert gases, from which center of the fulcrum zero of polarity, all polarizing body forms extend to manifest vitalizing life and return as depolarizing forms to manifest devitalizing death. The inert gases are God's recording and repeating system. They record, remember, and repeat all actions and reactions of all things from eternity unto eternity. They broadcast all of creation to all creation, and likewise receive the broadcasts of all creation for rebroadcasting to all creation. The inert gases are zeros in the universal equilibrium. Polarity divides and extends the one light into electric thought wave cycles which appear from the one still light as moving pairs of moving lights and disappear into that still light for reappearance forever without end. The inert gases are the spiritual elements which born and reborn the physical elements and meticulously make spectrum records of their eternities of rebornings. The inert gases center all elements from within to control their unfolding cycles of polarizing-depolarizing form 
and balance them from without by two poles of still light to control the refolding of form into their zero C. The inert gases record purposeful unfoldings and give back to each corpuscle of motion its cell memory of purpose and its instinctive guidance. They likewise give back to awakening consciousness the records of all cycles of soul awakening which have been written in the soul seeds of all unfolding refolding body forms. The inert gases write down in God's book of light all that you and I and anyone has ever been. Likewise what the ant, the elephant, the tiger, violet and bee have ever been, or have ever done since their beginnings, and give them back to them after every rest period which divides their cycles. God's sole occupation is the building of moving body forms to simulate his one idea of cause and effect, which creation is. There is a very definite bridge between God and man. It is invisible in the vacuum of the zero stillness of God's kingdom, but it has a visible link at every point where that bridge touches the shores of the action universe of motion. That is something which every man can understand for he can hold the symbol of that great reality in his hand in the form of a simple seed. He has never known, however, that in that imperishable seed, within that perishable acorn, which he holds in his hand, is the whole answer to where the oak tree comes from to live and where it goes when it dies. That is something which the physicists can more readily understand when you tell him that the imperishable, invisible seed within that acorn is an inert gas, or a combination of several octaves of inert gases. God thinks in electric pulsations, which are recorded in motion as four pairs of rings, which are compressed into spheres. Each cyclic pulsation is manifested by the projection of four concentric light rings in one plane from one point of magnetic mind light in which the red half of the spectrum is on the outside of the rings and the blue half is on the inside. These four rings are the seed of the octave wave and occupy that position in the wave known as the zero group of elements or inert gases. You will note that an inert gas marked zero begins and ends each octave. The nine inert gases are the shores of the visible universe, where the invisible bridges, which link mind and motion, touch the moving action universe. There are nine of them because the bridge has nine parts, which we might call entrances to mortality and exits to immortality. The wave is created by dividing the four sexless rings of the inert gases into four pairs of oppositely sex-conditioned rings and projecting them toward sex mates of adjoining wave fields to find balance and unity in each other. God's concentrative thinking compresses these mate rings as they are projected. This is the general active uphill flow of energy principle which multiplies power and speed in the inverse ratio of the cube as they are thus centripetally projected until the red and blue pair of cyclonic vortices thus resulting collide at wave amplitudes midway between the two zero cathodes from which they were projected. This is the manner in which unbalanced and separated sexed pairs are united into the oneness of the two balanced and equal hemispheres of spherical incandescent suns. Within the four zero rings of the wave, 
is the cathode mother womb of space, which is seeking the outside to fulfill her office of borning the seed of the father. To aid this process, the four pairs of projecting rings gradually close up their centering holes as the rings are compressed from their cone bases towards their apices, where the collision of sex mating completes the closing in the incandescent sphere thus formed. Likewise, all chemical elements of the octaves are red and blue lights which are projected from the pure white light of their inert gases, which are their octave seed. They return to their invisible oneness by radioactive emanations which are pure white incandescent microscopic suns. Man calls them alpha, beta, gamma, or helium rays as they emanate from tungsten, actinium, radium, or uranium at almost the speed of light. Each of them is the seed for another body of its like kind, as suns are seed for all bodies. There are nine of these inert gases in nature, as you will see by the nine-stringed harp of the universe. The only difference in their structure is that each consecutive inert gas from one to nine is smaller than its predecessor, for each octave is a multiplication of its predecessor. The upper diagram marked AA represents the creation of an octave of tones, beginning with the inert gas of four motionless rings centered by the stillness of universal energy to act as cathodes at both ends. This pair of four rings divide and extend their pairs of four rings toward approaching mates. Electric compression causes the rings to begin to spin, then to become smaller and turn faster as they approach the plane of collision where all four pairs unite to form a sphere. This represents the centripetal half of the journey which charges, polarizes, heats, and multiplies potential. These are the qualities necessary for increasingly vitalized life. Observe carefully what now happens. Centripetal force reaches its maximum and begins to die, and centrifugal force takes over. Look again at the top diagram in figure 42, and carefully note that the four rings of the inert gases are like the four rims of wheels placed within each other, with one common hub. Now note that the four rims become the hub when they are compressed and extended. Observe also that the extensions cause the appearance of cones as centripetal force winds the cone bases into a sun at the apex point of collision. The electric current begins and ends at cathodes. Cathodes are still points in the zero universe from which the energy of desire for creation is expressed. Chemically, cathodes are the inert gases of the octaves, which are not elements, for they will not mix with them. They are the seed from which the elements spring and to which they return. From the spectrum standpoint, they are white light from which all colors extend when put under electric strain and to which they return when the strain ceases. From the tonal point of view, they are the keynotes of the octave from which one can never escape knowledge of their presence in every tonal harmony. From the mathematical point of view, they are the zero of the whole octave. From the geometric form point of view, which its basis for motion gives it, the inert gas consists of four rings, one within the other. Each octave of the elements grows from its inert gas, just as a tree grows from its seed. The inert gases record and store for repetition all that has gone before in that octave. In the middle leaf table of the elements, hydrogen is shown without an inert gas. This is as impossible as producing a child without parents. That omnipresent point from which you have issued your body 
is the same point at which the visible mortal you becomes invisible and again assumes immortality. That one point in all this universe controls your every movement from your first one many millions of years ago to the last one which consummates the idea of man as expressed by you. That one point is your soul of the universal soul. It is your mind of the universal mind as one unit of creation. You are one with that mind. In fact, you are that mind. Your body is the thinking and imagining of that mind. The eternal you is that center and your eternal body is that series of four rings of fluorescent light which is eternally wrapped around that centering soul of the eternal you. Those four rings are eternal records of you. They are as immortal as you are immortal. They are the microfilm of you yourself. The illusion of motion deceives everyone so that the profound laws have been written by scientists which don't have the slightest foundation of truth in them, much less the very fundamental laws that I could see behind the scenes. When I came back, I bought textbooks to find out the names of that which I knew in space, in the universe, in another way as zero. One, two, three, four, zero. Four, three, two, one, and back to zero. That is all I needed to know. And the names of those, one, two, three, four, etc., are in textbooks. Lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, one series of elements after another. But to me, they were always one, two, three, four, zero. Four, three, two, one, zero in everything. Whether that was the octave spectrum of color or the octave on the piano.
Today we're going to talk about sacred geometry, the Fibonacci sequence, the flower of life, the Merkava, energy, frequency, and how all of these things impact each and every one of us in our lives, in our daily lives. So today we're going to talk about the Vesica Pisces. It is just the very rudimentary, basic beginnings of what we are, what this place is, and what kind of say-so we have in this place. As you just looked at, there's three images I shared with you on the Vesica Pisces. I want to talk about this, the basics of how important that even just those beginnings are a wonderful way for us to start. We are all working on setting our intentions on our Merkaba and also getting our Merkaba activated and I hope that everybody is working on that uh, because now we know that we are able to do this ourselves. Now let's talk a little more about the Vesica Pisces. The synchronicity of the universe is determined by certain mathematical constants which express themselves in the form of patterns and cycles in nature. The outcome of this process can be seen throughout the natural world, as you just seen with those very basic symbols that actually, you know, resonate and radiate all the way through and through us and everything we see. I would call them the basic fingerprints. These days of mathematical and geometric uh, constants our confirmation that certain proportions are woven into the very fabric of nature. Recognizing the significance of the simple fact offers us the means to understand how and why such matters were considered sacred. They and everything around us are a product of a delicate balance between chaos and order. The word geometry can be traced through its component parts. The word geo slash metri comes from the Greek words of geos, meaning earth, and metron, meaning to measure, uh, which together literally translates as the measuring of the earth or earthly measurements. Um, an art which was traditionally restricted to the priesthood. Think about that one, guys. It was hidden from the general population, but um, starting in the Greek times, um, was given out to the general population. Think about the, the Bible, you know, half of it was written in Hebrew and half of it in Greek. Not gonna think about, guys. Sacred geometry has existed for, in many forms across the ages. It is often mistakenly said that geometry began with the Greeks, but before them was the Egyptians, the Sumerians, the Chinese, the Phoenicians, and of course, the builders of Western European megaliths, um, all of whom left clear geometric fingerprints in their greatest constructions. The Greeks may have well been the first to have offered geometry to the public, which is what I just said at large, but they were by no means the first to recognize it. Sacred geometry, the first steps. Again, I'm referring back to those images I showed you. One of the most common shapes in nature is the circle. It is therefore extremely significant to understand 
that all other geometric shapes can be determined from a circle. Uh, with the use of only a compass or string and a ruler straight edge, uh, as the following procedure illustrates. Yeah, starting with the Vesica Pisces, which is uh, one uh, is able to produce. See, they're so simple, it, you know, it's so simple, but then it just becomes this very beautiful, instant and balanced way of living. Um, in uh, there, you can also find it in, within the, in the Vesica Pisces. You can find the triangle, the hexagon, the pentagon, the square, so on and so on. The Vesica Pisces is um, one of the key starting blocks from which sacred geometry was applied to life. Yeah, what do you guys think about that? This is going to be the first of many as we are going to dive deep into the sacred geometry and the energetics, music, um, the Fibonacci, and many, many more to come. Have yourself a good day. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Michelle's Opinions. We're on this journey together. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe. You may want to bookmark this page. You can sponsor the channel for as little as a cup of coffee a month. But if you bookmark this page, we can continue on with the work there free of charge on their platform. I will see you soon. I love you all so much. Have a great day. Peace.
holographic self-similarity follows in the magnetic model, but what magnetism is is most definitely what people do not understand. As was said long ago by Faraday, magnetism is the dielectric field, dielectricity is the inertia. The loss of that inertia manifests itself in a geometric form pattern, but that form pattern is not three-dimensional. It is resultantly, and demonstrably so, three-dimensional in that it has volume, but magnetism itself is two-dimensional. It is only resultantly three-dimensional and contains and creates volume. It is not voluminous, but it is by definition that which creates volume by nature of the mass which it much tr must transverse. Here we can actually see the hypertrochoidal pattern that you actually find underneath the ferrocell as evidenced here for one of my videos and here as you can see a thousand times over the quote-unquote spirograph like, spirograph like pattern that uh, forms the construct. What these are are constructive and destructive interferences as commonly found in the double slit experiment but unfortunately modern science being the bullshit that it is it uh, thinks that light is both a uh, particle and wave but it is neither particle nor is it a wave a wave is not a thing rather what something does and certainly so there's no such thing as a photon that is misunderstanding the coaxial nature of light which a longitudinal pulse perturbation with resultant transverse electrical magnetic components necess necessitatively so resultant to its propagation but the propagation is in the field itself nothing is propagating in the sense of an object moving from point A to point B, but these are constructive and destructive interferences of the resultant divergent centrifugal magnetism interacting with the increasing inertia and acceleration of the centrifugal. But the centrifugal is not magnetism per se, not specifically denotatively, but we can say that it is so superficially so. This is the confusion of the misunderstanding by everybody in the world as to the conjugate nature and the relationship of magnetism to dielectricity. We can't say that the head side of a coin is something completely different than the tail side of the coin. Obviously, they both entail the coin, or actually, specifically would be the case, the head and the tail would be the magnetism, but the silver of which the coin is made would be the dielectricity. You uh, certainly do not uh, have the magnetism without the dielectricity or the dielectric silver, as, we, as if we were in that analogy. Let's take a look at the central toroid. We'll actually see here a two-dimensional model. Here we have a three-dimensional representation. This conjugate geometry, if we actually take the inverse of the toroid, we have the hour, hourglass pattern of the hyperboloid, which forms the conjugate nature with the toroidal, the creation of not space and volume, itself, but magnetism and space and volume are synonymous. The loss of that inertia as manifest three-dimensionally only results in two, the necessary mass which it must transverse and which resultantly is the therefore rise of phase and is uh, therefore the result is rise resultantly of voluminous geomagnetic precession. We actually have to understand two-dimensional geometry. We have to understand what the hypertrochoidal is. We also have to understand what geomagnetic precession is. We can actually do, or you can do specifically, a lookup on what geomagnetic precession is. And specifically, two-dimensional Poincaré disk model of projective geometry, which necessitatively spells out the nature of a two-dimensional model as projected in three-dimensional uh, geometry. Now let's actually show that with a really, really simple program here. Here you can actually see the pattern of the uh, ferro cell on this uh, simple two-dimensional uh, pattern, which uh, will draw out in 360 degrees a circle. Well, you don't see a circle here. You see a top-down view of the torus, obviously so. And here we have it underneath the ferro cell of constructive and destructive interference. And of course, we have the black spot where no constructive or destructive interference is occurring. We have the top part of the hyperboloid, or the top of the hourglass, if you were, showing the uh, field geometry of increasing inertia and acceleration, i.e. the dielectric. The two of these together are the conjugate, which uh, define one another. The dielectric uh, defines the magnetic, and the magnetic defines the uh, field geometry of, uh, the, uh, of the dielectric. So let's uh, erase this and start over. And here's where we'll have to understand, and you'll have to research, what it is, the Poincaré disk model of projective geometry. And all I'm going to do 
I needed to find the center to do this. All I'm going to do is draw a circle as best I can. Only a circle, but it will be manifest in replication in 360 degrees opposite to where I'm drawing it and also in 90 degrees and uh, 45 degrees and so on. I think with uh, 18 uh, manifestations, but all I'm doing is drawing a simple circle. But here we have, and let's do it again, except try to be more perfect since I'm doing this by hand. Here we have the hypertrochoidal pattern, which shows the magnetic circle. The only way the loss of inertia manifests itself is the manifestation of a circle. It's a two-dimensional circle, but magnetism is three-dimensional, or is the creation of three-dimensional space. But this is necessitatively only due and results in to the mass that it is three-dimensional. Magnetism itself, if we were to take a point of inertia, which is certainly so a nonsensical term since there is no point, uh, inertia itself is non-Cartesian. It is by definition counterspace and the true definition of what energy is. But if we were to take a single point and uh, apply the, uh, the loss of that inertia, which follows uh, 1 over 5 to the power of negative 3, we will see what we have is actually just a two-dimensional circle where the loss of pure potential is cartesianally manifest in a circle and replicated here in fullness. You'll actually see we actually have what appears to be a three-dimensional top-down torus. And this, of course, is what we see in the ferro cell. Magnetism is two-dimensional. Inertia, the loss of that inertia, and this, of course, is perfectly in line with a holographic uh, model of the nature of the universe. Uh, magnetism is only three-dimensional resultant to the nature of the mass by which it must, if coherent, reciprocate itself to termination. Really, it is an expanding circle. Not Nothing is moving like my cursor is currently. Moving outwards, as you see, my cursor is moving. We actually have, technically, I could draw this uh, same uh, two-dimensional geometry by showing an increasing circle going from an infinitesimally small uh, point, will actually be a counterpoint in counter space, to a larger and larger and larger and larger and larger circle. So that would actually be, according to the geometry of the nature of magnetism, the way in which I would, quote, draw the loss of inertia would be an increasing circle instead of a point moving out and then moving back again, kind of like a comet going around the sun. It would just be an increasing circle and then a decreasing one. Upon termination, nothing is uh, emitted by the loss of that inertia from counter space, but saying from implies a, a Cartesian coordinate, but counter space has no point by which we may define from. So we would actually have to imagine this as an expanding circle and then a contracting one, and then apply our understanding of geomagnetic precession because the loss of inertia and polarity is, uh, is only denotatively the inverse of counter space. There's obviously no such thing as a monopole, but polarity two-dimensionally is not a north pole and a south pole. A magnet doesn't have poles. It has the inverse of counter space. The, uh, the loss of that inertia is manifest obviously so three-dimensionally resultant to the mass of which it is present therein, i.e. the ma coherent magnetic field. So we not only have the divergence and the phase, but we have the geomagnetic precession, which draws out, if you will, for lack of a better term, this toroidal, because the inverse image of this torus is the uh, hyperboloid, uh, the uh, hourglass that is the negative image of a torus. The inverse of an hourglass is a torus, and the inverse of a torus is the hyperboloid. He's forming a geometry of force and motion, and the inverse geometry that, to that, inertia and acceleration. Everything begins with inertia and acceleration, within which we actually have a rate of decay of loss of inertia, which therefore manifests itself resultantly as the uh, hypertrochoidal two-dimensional or the magnetic field. But magnetism is not something different from dielectricity. Magnetism is just the manifestation of dielectricity. I kind of drew that really crooked. Magnetism is the manifestation of dielectricity as resultant to the loss of its energy, which is counter space, is pure potential, is pure energy, pure non-Cartesian uh, actuality. This is uh, true power is rest, not manifestation of power. One might think 
ignorantly as any human would, being would that power would be an atomic bomb going off, for example. Well, that's true power, a true power, one might think. But uh, obviously, it's just the inverse of that, magnetism being analogous to the explosion itself. But that is impotency. The release of that power, the release of that energy is force in motion. It is the absolute loss of true power. True power would be that uh, three-pound lump of plutonium that sits in your hand like an innocent baseball. I mean, that is true power. That is uh, about the closest analogy I could draw. I kind of drew that crooked there. Let's draw hard to draw a perfect circle freehand like this on a computer screen to get the hypertrochoidal pattern, but I, I think you get it now. So, anyway, thanks so much for watching. If you like this video, just click the link below. Anything to expand your mind. But this is the secret of Mother Nature, the conjugate nature of magnetism and dielectricity. Both are inextricably connected at the very core one Man magnetism is not something different than dielectricity magnetism would what we'd be calling uh would what we would uh denotatively and ignorantly call force but it's uh, not force it is simply the loss of inertia that we understand to be dielectricity or the counter spatial pure energy of the nature of the universe its manifestation being force in motion we therefore call it something else even though it is not something else, we call it magnetism, but there is not an autonomous uh, field modality known as magnetism. It is uh, simply a, uh, an expression of the loss of the potential of dielectricity, which must only and necessitatively form the geometry which we call magnetism, which is the creation of space and volume and force and motion. All of these are one and the same thing. That's the power as manifest, but not the power in true, which is completely unmanifest, necessitatively and logically so. Please explain briefly what you mean by the term extending the fulcrum. In my understanding, the fulcrum is the span that supports the seesaw. Do you mean by extension to make it higher? Or do you mean to make the seesaw lower, longer? I mean to make the extension a fulcrum of the seesaw. The fulcrum is there in nature always. The moment you express a desire to do something to make an action, then you extend from the fulcrum both ways. You make the seesaw. That's what it is, is to extend it to the amount of energy that you have. If you do not extend the fulcrum, you seemingly extend it. You seemingly divide its power. Because either boy, uh, children on either end of the seesaw can express the power of motion. But that is all they do, express the power of motion. And that power of motion they express is the power borrowed from the stillness of the falcon at the center. I do not always have to like to say it's a seeming extension because the universe is only seeming. Uh, perhaps if I use the word it's a thought extension. And it is, it's an imagined extension. In your thinking, you imagine. And you cannot imagine without, you cannot imagine are objectively without creating motion objectively in your imagining. And so it is in the thinking process of nature there seems to be an extension or division which takes power or borrows seeming power 
without borrowing it, but seeming to, before I say it, the extension of power is like the person pulling away from the fulcrum with an elastic band that stretches and strains and makes it harder and harder and harder to pull away from it. But on the opposite side, as equal pulling, pulling away to balance that pulling. But the power is in the fulcrum, not in the thing. For if a man, if, for instance, if you, if you stood out on the prairie and pulled at the rope, you have no difficulty in pulling at that rope. It does not pull you back. But you hit your post there, and the post does not move. And you take an elastic band, and you hit it to it, and you stretch away from it. You find it pulling back? Therefore, you have created two conditions at the same time. You can bring the condition extension, condition of extension, and condition of expansion, and of, uh, of retraction. That's the action and reaction later. From the zero, you have extended in every direction, because you cannot extend this direction from the fulcrum without extending in the opposite direction to balance it. The two conditions of concentration and concentration of mental thinking have been established in, a, in what we call an electric current. If you let that elastic go, it will go back to where it started from and disappear in the fulcrum. That fulcrum is the zero. That which evolved from the fulcrum is a multiplication of that zero plus and minus. One balancing the other, one offsetting the other. You borrow 50 from here, from that, by your pulling. 50 plus. On the opposite side of that is a 50 minus. 50 minus and 50 plus total together a zero. Nothing in nature ever exceeds zero. It seems to. And so we have a multiplied and multiple, multiplying and divided universe into pairs of opposite conditions of compression and expansion, two opposite pressures which make the test possible to run our engines and do all the things we have and run the engine of our heartbeat and so forth. But the fulcrum of every never extension, every cease our motion. The fulcrum never moves. That is the zero and the elastic bands will pull together and disappear into the light from which it came, into the zero light from which it came to divide itself into two lights that will illumine the bodies that have extended from it. Those lights illumine and warm and heat and cool the bodies that are extended from it to make a universe like that. To make a universe that fits the imaginings of your mind. When it retracts back to that, there's no more warmth to warm the bodies, no more light to light the bodies. The imagined universe disappears in so far as that one desire is concerned. Life has appeared and disappeared in death, and it will again reappear. The extension of the fulcrum and its multiplication to a point of equal Potential to that which is borrowed from the Paul Falcon is right with all of the effects that is created by so doing, the effects of warmth and heat and cool and growth and decay and moisture that make up this universe. And when that elastic band pulls that back into the Falcon, there's an absolute disappearance of all it. The whole universe can't disappear at once because it isn't created that way. But that one, that one pulsation will, will 
disappear. And the pulsations which appear by extending the pulsum and retracting those pulsations begin with an incredible speed, with an incredibly small duration. Frequencies of millions and millions of extensions and retractions. The seesaw extends with the retracting so that its frequency is 186,000 miles a second. The frequency is growing larger, duration, accumulating, accumulating time until the frequencies are so slow that it gives you one in 50 years of a tree, perhaps. The ant, the elephant, the sun, the solar system. Multiplied time, multiplied frequency, multiplied ability to accumulate these frequencies and wind them up to retard time for the sake of multiplying power. That's the level principle. That's the fulcrum level principle. Shorten the lever, you lose time, you gain power. A man, by shortening the lever sufficiently and getting on the long end of it, can lift time. Well, without that lever, he could only lift 100, 150 pounds with the lever and pulsum of his own body. He's limited to that, but with the, as our committee said, give me a pulsum and a lever long enough and I could move the universe. It's true. Does life spring spontaneously from nature? The college professor said it did not. Um, there is nothing spontaneous in nature, in the sense that it is you. Everything in nature is planned. Everything in nature is the result of a desire to become, a desire to express in motion the idea of mind. Nothing spontaneous happens in your kitchen. In motion, the idea of mind. Nothing spontaneous happens in your kitchen after the dinner dishes have gone there. <laughs> A desire to reassort them is followed by action. And the fulfillment of your desire takes place by action. A word spontaneous is used often in the, na in the relation of combustion, spontaneous combustion. If you leave a pile of refuse out somewhere and some kindlings in it or, or even some decaying vegetation in earth that will burst into flame. That's not spontaneous combustion. That's the result of accumulated power accumulated the power of decay.
gases begin the first octave, very dense metals, and the ninth octave, like the plutonium being the last of the natural octave, or last of the natural elements. So you have very few rings with gases. You can start with hydrogen, one electron or whatever. They call it an electron. There's no such thing, but it's more of a ring. And that ring, in, of, um, I kind of think like to use these words. There's a protonic force of inward motion or compression, a neutronic force, which is a point of reversal, and then an electronic force, which is the point of a of expansion back to stillness. So stillness compresses to a point and then expands in a reversal of direction back out to stillness. There's a protonic force of inward motion or compression, a neutronic force, which is a point of reversal, and then an electronic force, which is the point of, the, of expansion back to stillness. So stillness compresses to a point and then expands in a reversal of direction back out to stillness. And the way you can look at that too in, in nature is the breath. You breathe in, you start at zero, you breathe in, you stop at zero reverse direction and exhale out to do it again. So Walter's primary law is balance. If you need two words, rhythmic balance. If you need three words, rhythmic balance to interchange. And basically what that is is a series of repetitions that repeats eternally. So you have removed the need for the Big Bang. And this is basically a mind wave universe that rotates on the still white magnetic light. Anywhere you look, the center of any object is a point of gravity. Gravity is not an inward pulling force in Russell science. It is stillness, which divides into a north and south shaft upon which motion then rotates. So wherever there is a center of gravity, there is motion surrounding it. And that center of gravity can be likened to God. It's, it means the same thing pretty much. Gravity and God are one in that sense.
The word magnetism connotes a physical attribute. A proper way to connect it to the electric universe of motion would be to term it the magnetic electric universe, meaning the spiritual physical universe, or the mind thinking universe, in the sense that the zero magnetic universe is the creator and the motion universe is creation. When man is fully aware of the fact that he eternally lives in the Creator's invisible magnetic light as one with it, and merely manifests life by action in the electric universe, he will then know that when action ceases, it merely ceases without affecting him, even as sound ceases without affecting him who made the sound. This is the construct. The Creator is the invisible, motionless, sexless, undivided, and unconditioned white magnetic light of omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent mind. The word magnetism denotes a physical attribute. A proper way to connect it to the electric universe of motion would be to term it the magnetic electric universe, meaning the spiritual physical universe, or the mind thinking universe, in the sense that the zero magnetic universe is the creator and the motion universe is creation. When man is fully aware of the fact that he eternally lives in the Creator's invisible magnetic light as one with it, and merely manifests life by action in the electric universe, he will then know that when action ceases, it merely ceases without affecting him, even as sound ceases without affecting him who made the sound. This is the omniscient universe of eternal mind qualities from which transient electric qualities emerge to simulate the qualities of the creator's magnetic light of mind, which are knowledge, idea, energy, life, soul, love, truth, beauty, rhythm, balance, law, silence, rest, and stillness. The magnetic light is sexless, for it is in equilibrium. Its electric division into pairs creates the dual sex condition, which we know as male and female. The Creator gives of itself to all the universe in an eternity of endless re -giving. The Creator's universe re-gives of itself to the Creator 
in an eternity of endless giving. That which the Creator gives is love. That which is regiven is love. That is the divine story of creation. It is a story of cause and effect in the giving and regiving of love. It is the one story of the Creator's knowing, expressed by thinking, illumined by the light of imagining. The time has come when unfolding intelligence in man should tell him that the divine spark of inspiration and the silent voice which speaks to him from within is the magnetic light of mind and the source of his energy. The Creator, who is the knower, is non-dimensional. The Creator's thinking is two-dimensional. The Creator's imaginings are three-dimensional. Creation consists of the invisible magnetic universe of mind, which man calls space, and the visible universe of motion, which man calls matter and substance. The Creator's still magnetic light is omnipresent and omnipotent. It is in and through everything, throughout eternity. The Creator's magnetic omniscience is expressed in the perfection of its electric creation.